Good morning. Welcome to my name is Austin, and welcome to Heartwood Presbyterian Church. This morning is from Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me and heard my cry for help. He brought me up from the desolate pit, out of the muddy clay, and set my feet on a rock to make my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Now please join me as we all say together, many will see and fear, and they will trust in the Lord. Our prayer of adoration is a prayer of Clement of Rome. Please pray, pray along silently with me. O God Almighty, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us, we pray, to be grounded and settled in your truth by the coming down of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. That which we know not, reveal. That which is wanting in us, fill up. That which we know, confirm, and keep us blameless in your service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I invite you to all respond along with me. Lord, we adore you. And now I'll turn it over to Laura for our first hymn. Good morning. The words to our first hymn actually come from Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 where John tells us, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And it's just a great reminder that all of our troubles here will vanish when Jesus comes again to reign. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. 
And Jesus said, Come unto me, all of you who are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Please pray along silently with me now as we pray our prayer of confession. Holy Father, we are followers of your son Jesus, but much of our following is from a distance, and so our discipleship does not bear much fruit. Forgive us when we have been satisfied appearing to be Christian without bearing the fruit of Christian love. Unite us to Christ in a strong bond of love and loyalty that the fruit of our labor may bring glory to you. And now I would invite you all to respond out loud along with me as we say, Lord, have mercy on us. Our assurance of pardon is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification, by the Spirit, and faith in the truth. It was for this that he called you through our gospel, that you may gain the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our hymn is, O Come Messiah, Come Again. Character Qualities, Family Nights, Tool Chest. Our theme for today is that though hard for you, there's nothing that God cannot do. It sounds like something Yoda would come up with, right? But God can do the things that we think are impossible. In today's Bible passage, we're going to see something that is going to happen in the future that seems like it would just be absolutely impossible today. It's hard to believe, but we have to remember that God loves us, and God can do anything, and God has a plan for the whole world and for you and me, too. Just like our theme says, though hard for you, there's nothing God cannot do. Would you please join me in prayer? Dear Jesus, help us to trust you and have faith in you and to believe that even when we read something in your word that seems impossible, help us to remember that though something is hard for us or seems impossible to us, there's nothing that you cannot do. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Please join me now and pray silently along with me for our prayer for illumination. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we're continuing this morning to look at the book of 1 Thessalonians. Paul, Silas, and Timothy founded a church in the Greek Roman city of Mas Macedonian city of Thessalonica on Paul's second missionary journey. They established this church which, which was made up of both Jewish people and non-Jewish people, and they really desired to stay there even longer and work with this church, but unfortunately, if they stayed any longer, 
they found that one of the new leaders of the church would unfortunately be murdered by some of the local people who did not like the idea that Paul and Silas and Timothy had set up a church in their city of Thessalonica. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy went to the Greek city of Corinth. Timothy actually went back later to check on the new church and see how things were going. And he came back and reported to Paul before he finished this letter of 1 Thessalonians, which he wrote about 19 or 20 years after the time of Jesus. There are at least four themes to the book of 1 Thessalonians. The first is Paul's thankfulness and his love for the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica. The second is Paul warning them and reminding them of the reality of persecution. The third theme is Paul telling them a little bit about what it's like to live the Christian life. And the fourth theme is what we're looking at today, and that's the idea that Jesus would be returning, and that unfortunately there were some uh, misconceptions out there about that, and Paul wants to clear those up. And so now, listen to the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you by a word from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, we who are left, will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I once heard a funny little saying. It said, working for the Lord doesn't pay very well, but the retirement plan is out of this world. Pretty cute, right? But it's true. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. That moment when each of us, along with every follower of Jesus who has ever lived before that moment, are united physically with Jesus. That event, or these events that are described in this passage, have been called by Christians down through the ages, the rapture. This would be a good time for you to pull out your sermon notes or maybe pull them up on your favorite device, whichever you, you prefer to use. Uh, first, we're going to see the impact of Jesus rising. Next, we'll see what happens when we witness Jesus' return. And finally, we will see Jesus' reunion. As today we discover that it's encouraging to remember that one day we will be united with Jesus. So first we're going to see the impact of Jesus rising. Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters. Now, there was some confusion among the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica about other followers of Jesus who had died. First, the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica thought that Jesus would return in their lifetime. And so, if that's so, why did some of their number physically die? Those who had fallen asleep refers to those who had died. Why didn't the Holy Spirit keep them alive until Jesus returned so that they could go to heaven to be with him altogether? Were they not Christians after all? Were they second-class Christians? The followers of Jesus in Thessalonica didn't know. And they had these searching questions. And so Paul wants to teach them, to inform them. Paul doesn't want them to grieve like those who have no hope. The Greek and Roman religion of this time and this culture was fatalistic. It did not offer a hope, a solid hope of life after death. The Greek gods were capricious and fickle. They were selfish and they couldn't be trusted. And that was one of the wonderful things about Christianity in this time and this culture. It gave people hope, a hope of life after death, a hope that human death was not the end, 
A hope that if one followed Jesus, eternity would be infinitely better than the misery they were experiencing in their lives in this time and this culture. Paul goes on to say, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which they did, and so do we, it's kind of like one of those theorems back in geometry, right? It's a given. Then, in the same way as Jesus rising, he would bring with him those who had fallen asleep. Paul wants the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica to know that their friends and their loved ones who had already died would not miss out on the resurrection. They would not miss out on the rapture. They would not miss out on eternal life. This is the part that many modern Christians in general and pastors in particular don't really talk too much about. Because at this point, the followers of Jesus who died and their spirits went home to be with the Lord, to be reunited with their resurrected bodies. We don't spend eternity as disembodied spirits or ghosts. We spend eternity in these bodies. Only these bodies as God intended them to be. More beautiful and more wonderful than any of us could ever possibly imagine. And so, it's encouraging to remember that one day we will be united with Jesus. Next, we see Jesus return. Paul goes on to say that these were given to him by a word from the Lord. In other words, God had inspired Paul directly, speaking to him directly to speak these things. Now, we don't know if Paul or if God spoke to Paul in a dream or a vision or what? Scripture just simply doesn't elaborate on that. We just know that God commanded him to give the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica this message. Now the followers of Jesus who were alive at the time of Jesus' return will not precede those who have died. Paul says this to reassure the Thessalonian followers of Jesus who had already experienced physical death that they would not miss out on the rapture. Those who had already died would not be forgotten about, nor would those who were physically alive have any advantages over those who had already passed away during this time. Everyone would be treated fairly by God, whether they were still alive on earth or whether they were already with the Lord. Now, while this idea of those who are alive and those who are already dead being treated differently at the time of the resurrection may seem trivial to us in our day and our time and our culture. It was important to the followers of Jesus in Thessalonica who were experiencing the threat of death because they were followers of Jesus. Furthermore, it might seem more important to us today than it did a year ago as we face our own mortality due to the plague of the coronavirus. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the archangel's voice and the trumpet of God. This will be spectacular. This is an event that has never been seen before nor will ever be seen after the event takes place. This is an event that is unique in time and history. This is the return of Jesus Christ with the glory of heaven to take his church home. When we experience this, and we will experience this, it will be more awesome and more wonderful than any of us could ever imagine. The shout is a military command as Jesus gives the command for this glorious event to occur. The archangel's voice is the sound that echoes that command for the followers of Jesus in heaven to obey his voice. The trumpet of God was another signal used in this time and this culture in military maneuvers to glorify 
and praise God in this moment. And all of creation will be made aware of Jesus' return at this moment. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the followers of Jesus who have physically died will experience a resurrection like Jesus experienced at Easter. They will come back to life. Their immortal souls, the very essence of their being, will be reunited with their resurrected bodies. They, or perhaps we, depending on when this event occurs, will receive their resurrected bodies, which again will be more beautiful and more wonderful than anything any of us could ever possibly imagine. And it's encouraging to remember that one day we will be united with Jesus. Well, finally, we see Jesus' reunion. Paul now speaks of those who are physically alive at the time of Jesus' return. He says, those who are alive at the time of the Lord's return will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those who are alive at the time of the Lord's return will meet him and his followers who have just been resurrected in midair. Now, this may seem a little far-fetched to us in our time and our culture. It seems more like maybe the special effects we see in a movie. But it must be remembered that this is a once in the history of humankind type of event. It's comparable to the creation of the universe in its uniqueness and magnitude. In fact, Paul himself probably thought that he would still be physically alive when this event occurs. Furthermore, I'm sure that there have been Christians down through the history of the church who thought they too would still be physically alive when this took place. And of course, there are those today who believe that Jesus will return in their lifetime. Regardless of whether Jesus does or does not return in our own lifetime, Paul says when he does return, we will always be with him after that. So this event marks a fantastic new beginning for the followers of Jesus who are alive at this time and for those who have gone before. Paul now applies this wonderful news to the present. The present situation of the Thessalonians who are living in times that they face persecution and other kinds of unpleasant things. But it also speaks to our own present time when he says, encourage one another with these words. In fact, this is potentially the best encouragement possible. No matter what we face today, the loss of a job, a broken relationship, a wayward child, or the coronavirus, if we are followers of Jesus, we can rest assured that those circumstances are not eternal. If we are followers of Jesus, this passage assures us that our eternal destiny is secure. Our feeble and frail human bodies are a curse, but the day will come when we will be transformed into what God intended us to be, and we will spend eternity with him. Where, as Revelation 21, verse 4, just a couple of verses after the song that inspired our opening hymn, there will be no more death, no more tears, and no more pain. Because it's encouraging to remember that one day we will be united with Jesus. Would you please pray with me? Dear Lord, give us faith in you. Give us trust in you. And encourage us that one day we will be united with you. And that day will be more wonderful than any of us can possibly imagine. In your precious name, amen. Our hymn is What If It Were Today.
you please join me in prayer? Father God, cause your spirit to encourage us. Use us to encourage each other. So one day we will be united with you. In that moment and for eternity. Lord, give us faith to suspend our disbelief, even though it may seem far-fetched to us, something more out of the special effects of a movie than reality. Help us to believe your word, that this is a once in the history of humanity type of event. And help us to trust you. Help us to trust you not only for that moment in the future, but to be encouraged to trust you with each moment of our lives, tomorrow, and next week, and next month, and next year, and into eternity. Lord, please be with all the members of our military serving here at home and around the world. Protect them and keep them safe. Be with their families and protect them and keep them safe too. That you, Lord, thank you that you have used them throughout our history to guarantee that we can come here this morning and worship you in peace and safety and without fear. Lord, please be with all of our first responders, our fire and rescue workers, and our law enforcement officers. Protect them and keep them safe. Give them wisdom and strength to protect and serve our communities, especially in this time of the coronavirus. Father God, please be with all of those who do suffer from the coronavirus. Comfort them and heal them. Bless them with a complete and total recovery. Please be with their families and comfort them. Lord, be with everyone who has not contracted the virus and protect them and keep them safe from this horrible plague. Be with those who have lost a loved one from the virus and comfort them in their grief. Be with those who suffer from other ailments, especially ones that are complicated by our current focus on the coronavirus. Be with all of our healthcare workers and their families Bless them, Lord. Give them strength and protect them. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now I'd invite you to take a moment and lift up your silent prayers to the Lord. pray along silently with me as I pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now please join me as we say out loud, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Our affirmation of faith this morning is from the Apostles' Creed, the traditional version. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, 
and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I would invite you to say out loud these words to affirm your faith. Lord, we affirm our faith in you. In dedication of the gifts that each of us has returned to the Lord's work here at Hartwood over the last week, let us now pray together our prayer of dedication. I will pray the prayer and I would invite you to pray along with me silently. Almighty and gracious God, giver of every good and perfect gift, our bounty knows no end, for the basket of our need is overflowing. With thanksgiving, we make our offering and pledge of our service to your kingdom's work. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. And now please join me as we all say out loud together, Lord, we dedicate our gifts to your kingdom. Lord, we dedicate our gifts to your kingdom. Our closing hymn is Soon and Very Soon. Spirit. Amen. Amen.